Here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara Devlin. <laughs> well, you're looking good there, Tom. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I just, uh, you know, I, was, I read your book again, and I was just telling everybody that we will know this country's on the right track when, when the Hidden History series is, is included uh, as required reading for every student in high school, I believe. I mean, this is such a great, concise background on the real history of American democracy. Now, what, what, when you say the hidden history, what do, you, what do you mean about hidden history of American democracy? Well, there's, there's a lot about our system and about our history that, that uh, is shrouded in mythology or is literally unknown or where people uh, believe things that uh, simply aren't true. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, you know, I wanted to clear a lot of yes. that stuff. Well, I, mean, I love the way you, you connect it to the Native Americans and you bring in Karl Marx and the, uh, and the Enlightenment, of course. But all of the, I mean, when you say Karl Marx, of course, that's uh, very triggering to, uh, to some people. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah. it really is all... I remember Marx being in the book. Yeah, well, is- yeah, yeah, he's in there. Because you talk about, um, where is it? I have it written down. Look, look on page. Look there on it page. is, 39. Page yes, 30. that's right. And Karl Marx and, wait, hold on. Oh, I was noting that Karl Marx yes. had, Engels had written that uh, he had followed the teachings of the Native Americans. That's yeah. right. Yeah, the uh, Karl Marx acquired and read a copy of Lewis Henry Morgan's 1877 Ancient Society. And, oh. and that was, uh, yes. So and and you connected it to the uh, you know the Enlightenment thinkers uh, Rousseau, Locke, and uh, of course these were the insp- inspirations for Jefferson and Adams and a lot of people don't really know this. This is why you know I think this is it's yet again you know another important book, but. Um, because one of the things that I know, I mean, as far as Republicans are concerned, they are, uh, they talk about how the country was founded in Judeo-Christian values. And what do you think about that? <laughs> no, it wasn't the founders were clear about this. I mean, there were, um, uh, kind of fundamentalist whack jobs among the founders. Probably the best well-known is, is Patrick Henry, the guy who said, mm-hmm. give me or give me death. He was the largest slave owner in the state of Virginia. He owned over 360 human beings mm-hmm. and was a brutal slave master. Uh, he was also an evangelical fundamentalist Christian who did not like the Constitution, argued against the Constitution at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He was the reason why James Madison changed the Second Amendment to change the word nation to the word state mm-hmm. to protect the, uh, the Virginia Slave Patrol, Patrick Henry's demand. Um, but he was he was kind of an outlier. Many of the other founders uh, were like Jefferson and Washington were deists or uh, were agnostic or, you know, many of them were Christians, but they just really believed that government and the church needed to be separate. Um, you know, uh, John Adams, for example, uh, when when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and this goes back to my riff about you know, nature uh, about democracy being natural for us and all animal species. But when Jefferson wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, he's got, you know, for the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, you know, basically this is ordained by nature's God, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. nature's God. And uh, John Adams goes in and scratches out nature's God and writes in Christian God. And then mm-hmm. Jefferson scratches out Christian God and writes in nature's God, which is where it stays. So, um, but but Adams who went to church sometimes two or three times a week and took mm. notes. And and uh, John, James Madison, who was Jefferson's protege, and Adams, of course, you know, Jefferson was his vice president. Um, and then they ran against each other in 1800. Um, they, they were emphatic that they did not want the government involved in religion or religion involved in government. And, mm. and in the case of Adams and Madison, it was because they... They wanted their faith to be pure. They didn't want their church corrupted by government. When Madison became president in 1809, the first piece of legislation that he vetoed, one of the few that he vetoed in his entire you know, term as president, terms as president, was a bill that, that uh, George Washington had started a poorhouse in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C. that was with federal money. 
that provided housing, medical care, food, and clothing to poor people, and or to the you know the truly indigent. And it, throughout the Washington and Adams administrations, this was and and Jefferson administration, this was funded directly by the government. There was a minor religious revival in America around 1810, and um, so this bill came to Madison that said that they were going to give the federal money to a local church, and the church would run it, you know, a faith-based initiative. Right, right. And, and <laughs> the father of the Constitution, James Madison, wrote a veto in which he said this would be establishing a terrible precedent for the nation, mm-hmm. um, bad for the church, it would be bad for the country, and it's a violation of the Constitution. Hmm. Right, because they wouldn't want to escape or fight a revolution against a government that was entwined with uh, with the church and right. an intergenerational aristocracy just to recreate right. that. Here. And, and you had the Church of England, you know, was was mm-hmm. one and the same as the British government. The Queen was the head of the, of the Church of England. Right. So, you know, the same deal. Jefferson was convinced that if a priest, which was the term he used, it was kind of generic for you know ministers of any kind. If a priest ever became president, the republic was doomed. Uh, Madison's protege didn't think that was a legitimate concern. He was more concerned that if the government ever started giving money to or dictating the terms of religion, that religion would be doomed. Right. And they had some dialogue going on about this for 30 years. And you know, it turns out they were both right. Right. That's so true. And I, but I feel like, you know, uh, we are, we're totally getting away from the, uh, the, the, for, for the most part, people don't really understand that this is, this government was founded in the liberal age of enlightenment as the antidote to the kind of system that the that ruled Western civilization for two thousand years, you know, the intergenerational aristocracy, the uh, you know where the rich run and own everything, and everybody else is in their place, in their natural place, like the king, right? And I feel like this is what the right wingers—they're rebuilding this here at home, uh, of course, with uh, you know, mom and apple pie. Uh, uh, while waving the flag and all that. And I know that you share this, my concerns about this time that we live in, but, I mean, uh, what do you, I mean, how, 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 how are you feeling today? I know <laughs> I wax and wane about it, too. Sometimes I'm very hopeful. I feel like it's always darkest before the dawn, but, you know, God help us, really, if uh, we if you know trump gets back in let's say i and uh i just don't know uh if we can survive it's really you know this country's young it's less than 250 years old and this is the grand experiment and it feels really sad that it seems to be slipping away so uh and i think it does begin with people not really understanding the true history that's another thing, you know. I wish that this book was required reading in in high schools, in the very least, because we don't really share a common history. It feels to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Which is which is unfortunate. In in terms of what I what I think or feel about the future, um, I think that uh, yesterday or the day before, when Trump uh, was at his most recent rally, mm. he made the comment that this will be the final battle. Mm. This election of 2024 is going to be the final opportunity to, in his, uh, you know, worldview or statement to to fix America. Um, I would say, you know, the opposite, the final battle to save America. Wow. His point was that he realizes, and I think I I really think it's true. He realizes that the jig is up with the GOP. Um, You've got an entire generation coming up that is not buying their BS, whether it's their climate change stuff or their, you know, give tax cuts to billionaires and it'll trickle down on all of us BS or, right. or, or the, you know, trashing the rights of women or going after the queer community, mm-hmm. whatever it be, you know, there's a whole generation coming up looking at that um, and, and going, this is this is total BS. We want nothing to do with this. So the Republicans see that coming. Uh, they also realize that there's a lot of pissed off women out there. Mm-hmm. And and then on top of that, um, you know, the, you've got the, the boomers, you know, my generation are are start also starting to wake up in a big way mm-hmm. because it's so clear that the Republicans want to gut Social Security yeah. and Medicare. Right. And so, you know, they, they've managed to piss off everybody about right. the only 
who are still with them are, are millennials and Gen Xers who are so busy trying to raise families and keep their head above water that they don't have time to tune into politics. And they're not paying attention to what's going right. on, which is a normal thing for that that generational cohort between roughly 30 and 60 or 25 and, and mm. 55. You know, they tend not to be as political as the people on the young and the old end because they just, you know, they're so wrapped up in life, right, in, right. The, in the busyness of life. But um, I, so and then on top of that, you've got the racial demographic change that is happening in the United States. But I think the big one is the generational one. You know, we're, we're getting about 10 million new uh, Gen Zers every mm-hmm. year, I think. No, it can't be that many. I, I read in The New York Times today and I, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I, yeah, I don't want to okay. number. I'm not sure of it, mm-hmm. but it's some huge number of, mm-hmm. gen, of Zoomers yes. are are aging into the over 18 voting population. And at the same time, about half that number of boomers are dying out, which is right. you know, the, the Fox News generation. So uh, I, I think that if we can make it through this election of 2024, yeah, and yeah. ideally if we can make it through in a big way and seize enough power to actually re- right the ship as it were, and you know, if our, the first legislation out of the gate in 2025 is to is to make voting an absolute right, which will right. shatter the the power of uh, at, at least half the red states yep. Yep. administrations, and then uh, strip money out of politics, which yes. will shatter the power of of the whole Coke network and all those guys. If we can roll back those two those two elements, we can put this country back together and make right. it work really well, and we can join all the rest of the developed countries in the world that have national health care systems and free college education <laughs> and, 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 and a large population that is unionized. Right. I mean, these, these are not radical ideas. No. Literally every other democracy on earth has these as central pillars of their democracy, and we don't have any of them. We've got 35 million people who have no health insurance. We've got 200 million people who are underinsured, or 170, or whatever yeah, the number is. Yeah. We've got we've got uh, two trillion dollars worth of student debt that is just crushing an entire generation of people. I mean, it, 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 no other country has these problems, right. mm-hmm. and they are brought to you 100 percent by by Republican politicians who've been bought and paid for by right wing billionaires. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And it's just the it's I feel that the the younger generation, because they've grown up in a very small world because of the Internet, they they see uh, they're, they're not susceptible to the lies as maybe my generation was or earlier or, you know, older generations, because they they see that yeah uh, other countries have universal health care like we stand alone here they have friends in other countries that they talk to on zoom and whatnot and they see that we're the only country that doesn't have any sick leave or or vacation time you know at all we have no vacation nothing you know we don't have the freedom to be human here you know to be free. Right, unless you're rich. That's the giant caveat. That's where the Republican Party lives, is they only look out for the interests of right. people who are, you know, over a million dollars a year. That's that's their that's their base. Right. Their real base. I mean, that's, that, that's where their money comes from. That's where their power comes from. And then basically, you know, the rest of their base, the, 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 the you know, lower middle class suckers who vote for them. Mm-hmm. It's just, that's just a scam that the GOP yeah. is for about right. 40 it's exactly. But it's just there. That's why they appeal to their bigotries. And I mean, it's just so clear. That's all they have. Yeah. This uh, anti trans, you know, this whole and it's really alarming, you know, the anti trans stuff. And I've heard you talk about it on your show, too. It's, this is it's right out of the Nazi playbook. I mean, there is no getting around it that that's how the Nazis they targeted. Uh, that's how they started. Yeah, that's how they started. Literally they, started. I mean, they had been talking about Jews for a long time, but when it came to actual persecution, the Nazis started with trans people. Mm-hmm. And trans people, they went to gay people, you know, gays and lesbians. And then from there, they started on the religious minorities. And right. right. It was all about protecting the children, too. I mean, this is what's so chilling. There's a movie about this out. Have you seen well, it? I haven't seen it, but I've, I'd say oh, I, in my I queue. It. What, it's yeah. called... Uh, El it's called Dorado. El Dorado. It's an hour and a half documentary on uh, Netflix, and it is and and there's they show the historical footage, and then they cut away to scenes where actors are playing the roles of the people in the in the history. Right. And but but ac- fully accurate scenes. 
and uh, so you get to, you, you really get to see how 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 Germany changed in that period from 1933 with the rise of Hitler until the end right. of the war, right. uh, and through the eyes of this of this uh, gay nightclub, the yeah. Eldorado. Right. Oh wow. Some, yeah. Some yeah, we've talked about it on the show how um, the because there was a gay center in Berlin. That was it. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there, yeah, there was a scientific center that was associated right. with it too. And yeah, the guy, gender the, studies, the right? And uh, they did um, they did gender affirming they did their care, surgery. They yeah. and and they were and and they were providing normal you know stuff, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. areas, counseling and abortions and childbirth. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Berlin was uh, was a beacon of progressive uh, of progressivism. And that's the 20s, yeah. and into the early 30s, yeah. actually, wow. right up to 33 when Hitler took over. And then he put an end to all that. Like, that. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that is the that is another history that is kind of like the hidden history because people really don't know about that that's why it's really good that 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 documentary exists on netflix and especially it's incredibly relevant which i thought i mean especially when i was reading your book too i was like this is so such a relevant book right now because one of the things i talk about on my show too is that we is the problem that we don't have a common history here we don't seem to share and that's part of what republicans you know they talk about government schools and you know they don't want us to have a common history, but how do we? How do you have a country if you don't have a common history? You know. It's, yeah, I don't call who it was who said it, but you know, he who controls or they who control the past control the present, mm-hmm. and those all the present control the future. I guess right. that's right. Right. And so, right. And so the, the first step is controlling the past, and controlling the past means controlling the schools. Yes. That's why you see these billionaires funding these programs you know, with these right wing right. moms and whatnot mm-hmm. who are attempting to control our schools and, and change our history. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, in Florida now, uh, the, it was just up tonight in the news, um, they're te- they're, the, the state uh, board of education or whatever is going to be requiring them requiring history teachers in Florida elementary schools to teach children that there was a benefit to slavery, that slaves learned. Oh, no. Are you kidding me? This is like, this is an abomination. There's a benefit to slavery? To the slaves. (laughs) The slaves. Oh, well, that is what, I mean, wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's really the perspective of what the slave owners would say. Of course, they were teaching people. It's the same old racist trope that Republicans use now when they talk about welfare. Uh, uh, you know, not so ironically, you know, they talk about the dignity of work, teaching people the dignity of work. And that's the same thing that they would say about enslaving people. They had to teach uh, black people, of course, because otherwise they would hang around in the, and do nothing. You know, it's the same kind of, it's the same racist trope they use about welfare, you know, putting aside the fact that you know, as a percentage more white people are on welfare than people of color, but okay, that doesn't, you know, facts have a liberal bias, so we don't really need to worry about it. But you know what I mean? They're, it's just, they rehash the same racist tropes. And now, I mean, just hearing this, I, I, it's almost, it's stunning to me. I don't even know how, how, why, how, why, you know, it's like the guy who was caught on tape recently, I can't remember what state, saying that the Tulsa race Riot, uh, oh, the That's race the massacre race. that wasn't, you know, don't teach that it was about race, which, well, I mean, I, I guess the what the shining light is that the uh, uh, is the overarching feeling is that yes, they are ridiculous, they are, re- they sound ridiculous, and it almost it highlights it even more than we could even highlighted just by talking about it. They, they really are showing who they are. And like you're saying about young people, they, the, the young people aren't buying this, no matter what. It's like the last gasp of, a, of like the horror, the creature in the horror movie, you know, you think he's dead and then he comes back up, you know. 
<laughs> that's what it feels like. But, you know, hopefully, I mean, legally and peacefully, we can, like, stomp them down. But uh, I just think, wow, what a, you know, I mean, it could really go either way. You know, something, because I am, a, I, I love history, too, like you. And, uh, and I especially have always um, studied the history of World War II and the rise of Nazis. And it's really chilling, you know, to see um, how we are at this crossroads here. And one good thing, though, is that you could hear on the, on the regular mainstream media, they're talking about it, too, which is actually a good thing, which, you know, for years, they would never say, the word fascism at all. And now, you know, the media pundits like Joy Reid and whatnot, they're talking about it openly, which is, that's good. But yeah, I mean, uh, we're in, uh, we're, we're living in very interesting times, that's for sure. And uh, so let me see. When um, I wrote down some questions here, but it doesn't really matter. I know you only have uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> so it says, what challenges do you foresee in revitalizing democracy in America? And how do you propose overcoming them? That's a, that's a good yeah. one. Well, I think the challenge that we face is the structural challenge that the Republicans have erected. They've mm -hmm. made it really hard to vote in uh, the blue cities that are located within red states. Uh, right. and, that's, and that's having a national influence. Um, they, they, they're purging voters off the voting rolls to the tunes of millions a year, right. in, mostly in blue cities and red states. They're, they're uh, changing the, the rules around voting to make it harder for working people to vote. I mean, who can, who can stand in line for six hours? Right, right. right. And, and um, you know, that, that is probably going to be the major impediment because those laws are not going to go away. In fact, the Supreme Court has yeah. reaffirmed them. Oh. And in 2018, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the ability of John Husted in uh, in Ohio, the, the Secretary of State there, to to just like purge people from voting wow. rolls. It was mail out a postcard to them, and he can right. he's mailing it to it. He can just take right. the, the, the the registered Democrats, you know, and just or or you know, in this it looked like at the time he was doing it mostly into black neighborhoods. And he mails a postcard in, and either if they don't send the postcard back or if they fail to send the postcard back, depending on the type of postcard, um, they get dropped off the voting rolls. Right. And there's all be, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent uh, of people who, even if the postcard was great and said, if you don't send this back in giant letters, yeah. the right to vote. but instead they make it look like junk mail. Yep. So it's like yep. a 50 percent, uh, you know, uh, lack of return or return mm -hmm. rate. So. Literally, you send that out to two million people, and suddenly you've got the ability to pull a million wow. people off the road perfectly legally with the with the approval of the Supreme Court. And they're doing it, like I said, to the tune of a million dollars or a million, you know, million voters a year. So what what is the rationale from the Supreme Court? Do you know what they what they said? That states get to make their own rules with regard to elections, which is what it says in the Constitution. But that I mean, for years that that's uh, voter caging, and that's that was illegal. And Alito, in in uh, actually, the, you'll see this in the article that I'm publishing tomorrow on HartmanReport.com. Actually, Alito in that decision, I quote from that decision, that Supreme Court decision, and Alito in that decision um, pointed out that. Uh, there are millions and millions of Americans who are registered to vote in more than one state and uh, use that as the justification to allow uh, Husted to what he was doing in Ohio. Now, the fact of the matter is there are millions of people who yeah. are voted to register, register to vote in multiple states. I, you know, I in the last 10 years, uh, I, you know, I lived in. Um, I lived in Vermont, I've lived right. in Oregon, and I moved to Oregon, then I went back to Washington, D.C. and lived there, and then I came back to Oregon. I didn't notify any one of those three right. states that I had arrived or I had left for voting purposes. I simply never voted more than one place. Right. It's normal. You know, 7% of Americans move every year. It's absolutely normal that people yeah. are registered in more than one state. What's abnormal is that they try to vote in both those states. That just doesn't yeah, happen. Exactly. I mean, that, you know, they, they, they are able to identify maybe 20 or 30 cases a year of people who do that kind of fraud. Nobody does that. 
Exactly. So it was a non-problem, but for Alito, it was enough of a justification to allow Ohio to go ahead and purge a million people off the voting rolls in Cincinnati and Toledo. Right. As, as if you're going to get on a plane and, and fly back to Washington or something and, or D.C., you know. And, yeah, typically when it's, when it's done with a mail-in ballot. But, say, you know, it, right. it, it's do True. it. True. I mean, nobody, you know, first off, nobody thinks their vote is that important. <laughs> it's like, right. I risk right. going to jail for one friggin' vote. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, who, and that's the thing, when there there is voter fraud, it's, you know, generally people are caught and there's there's repercussions and it's never <laughs> anything that's going to tip the election. You and know? ironically, what we've seen in the last four years is that most of the voter fraud is be, that gets caught is, I mean, like that's over 80 percent right. of it is Republicans. Exactly. And the reason why they're doing it is because the party has convinced them yes. that everybody else is. That's you know, they're right. so convinced that Democrats are regularly and routinely committing voter fraud that they assume that there's no penalty mm-hmm. to it and no risk to it. It's and hey, true. everybody's doing it, so they just go ahead and do it. And in fact, no Democrats are doing this. Mm-hmm. Or it's and, true. And frankly, most Republicans are not doing this. It's right. just, a, like you said, 20, 30 people yeah. a year. Give and they're all from the shot. villages. <laughs> right? yeah. It's true, though. Yeah. Many of them are from the villages. But that's, Oh, there were six or seven of them from the villages. Yeah, you're that one I, retired definitely. community that's mm-hmm. But that's what you're saying. Yeah. No, you're right, 100%. They're, they're doing it because... They be, they're being told that that's it's been so their defense in a couple of cases that have come to trial. Is they've literally their defense has been well, you Democrats are doing this. Why? Well, why am I? Interested? Well, I mean, you think these people are ever going to wake up? I wonder. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I think that actually, I think that there's a gradual awakening kind of washing over the GOP, and and this is why. Although you see, you know you see these numbers like Trump's popularity with the Republican. House, and it's getting higher and higher. And all right. the, the Republican Party is shrinking. Yeah. You know, the number of people who will identify publicly as Republicans and the number of people who are registered as Republicans is shrinking, both right. those numbers. Right. And so when you get a smaller pie, you know, a, a slice that has the same amount of, of uh, blueberries in it is now yeah. a bigger piece of the pie. You know, it looks like it's bigger relative to the pie because the pie is getting smaller. Right. So, you know, that's what's going on. I, it's right. not that Trump is becoming popular. He's just more popular with Republicans that's because right. the, the rational Republicans are leading. Yeah, that's true. Left. That's true. If if you are if you have any shred of integrity, I think you've already gone. Yeah, that's true. How could you stay? I mean, if the Democratic Party was turning into what the Republican Party is, you know, we'd be gone. You know, yeah. but so Tom, I have to thank you yet again. You're uh, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show. This this My show. pleasure. You, Thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for your uh, your amazing uh, Hidden History series. And I, I mean, I learned so much uh, from your books and your show every single day. And I just, you know, I'm glad that uh, we're both at the barricades together, you know, trying yeah. to make this uh, country work for work for all, I suppose. But th- thank you so much, really. And, Tara, uh, thanks so much for inviting me on your program. I really appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.